Happy Friday, America. Thank you very much for joining us today. My name is Brian Engelman, and you are listening to the New American Media Radio. That's TNAM Radio, because the news always matters. You're joining us today for the Unhappy Hour Sports Show. I, your host, have been a Cleveland Indians, Cleveland Browns, and Cleveland Cavs fan, super fan, all through college and post-college. Here we are residing in Los Angeles, California, watching the Kings, watching Kobe, watching Blake Griffin, watching the Dodgers. But I still care about my roots. I still care about where I'm from. Those are the teams I still follow. And on this show, we mix sports and politics and spirituality and economics. I was thinking about LeBron James in Cleveland versus Kevin Garnett in Minnesota. It kind of reminded me how the Cavs were willing to spend money and improve the team. The Timberwolves were not a good situation. Kind of the parallels between U.S. business giving up, going to China or closing the doors. The difference between divorce and working on your marriage. Those types of topics and more. Today, here we go. It's Friday, and you know what that means. It's time for the Unhappy Hour live sports radio show on the New American Media.com. Here is your host, Brian Engelman. Uh, thank you very much. I'm going to try to say that again. All of these topics and more. See, I can say the word topic from time to time. Thanks for joining us. I am Brian Engelman. This is the Unhappy Hour program. We are thinking NBA. In fact, I had a, I had a conversation, two conversations with LeBron James. It was a dream, but I woke up thinking about the difference between LeBron leaving Cleveland and Kevin Garnett leaving Minnesota, and the difference between someone like Kevin Durant, who wins multiple scoring titles playing for a small market team, a small market team, Oklahoma City, they've advanced. They are there for the NBA Finals. And it's, it, it's the difference between staying home and working on the thing that, that, that you have that might have problems, but you work on it until it works. You keep trying. You keep getting knocked down, but you stand up. You get knocked down, you stand up. You don't give up. You know, and, and I just want to say to all Seattle Supersonics fans, I'm sorry, man. I'm sorry, girls. I'm sorry. <sighs> That's got to be really rough watching, you know, the NBA team that used to play in Seattle the Seattle Supersonics just disappear a couple years ago, go to Oklahoma City, and now they're in the Western Conference Finals. Got a 50-50 chance to win an NBA championship. As Cleveland Browns fans had learned when Art Modell took the Cleveland Browns to Baltimore, where a few years later they won a Super Bowl. It's really hard. It's not fun. So I would like to just reach my hand out in uh, condolences, in frustration, in agony to the Seattle Supersonics fans. We are going to stop that train of thought, and we're going to get right to this. We're going to bring in Zach Barris, NBA scout. He is live at the NBA scouting combine with a whole bunch of news without any further delay. <laughs> any further delay. Here's Zach. All right, we're keeping a running tally. We've been tongue-tied twice. Try to say that three times fast. Tongue tied twice. Hello? Zach, it's Brian with the New American Media's Unhappy Hour program. You're live on the air. How are you doing, Zach? Uh, good. Just sitting at the President's Club in the area in O'Hare Airport right now. Very nice. So, why are you out at O'Hare Airport? Coming back from the NBA Draft Combine. And tell, tell us a little bit about that. But first, what do you do that brought you out to the Draft Combine? Give, give our listeners your background. Um, I currently work as a scout with the NBA. I've been in my position now for two years. I scout high school and college talent for my job and it takes me all over the country and scouting new players every day, it seems like. And if people are going to appreciate and enjoy the content of what you're about to discuss, where can they find you online on Twitter and whatnot? You can find me on Twitter at Z Barris, uh, Z B A R I S. All right. Well, let's talk about the NBA Scouting Combine. 
Uh, it was definitely an experience uh, on its own. I'll say that. I've never experienced anything like this before in my life. I'm just glad to be a part of it. Uh, it was hosted at the University of Illinois, Chicago. I flew in. I got it. I took the red eye out of L.A. Uh, Wednesday night, got it Thursday morning. Uh, went to the hotel, slept for about two hours, and then headed over to uh, the university. Uh, it was really interesting. Uh, you get to see the players participate basically in one-on-one, three-on-threes, and five-on-five -five drills. Um, and, and, and it's just interesting. You see the players weigh in, you know, you check their height, uh, body fat, and also their height with shoes on and without shoes on. I don't even know why you would measure a player without shoes on because when, when is a player going to be, you know, deep playing socks? You know, I find that interesting. <laughs> but right. looking at it, um, I think there were some risers this weekend, and, I, you know, I don't think really anyone fell too badly this weekend. But uh, one, of the big, one of the biggest risers this weekend was Myers Leonard, the center out of uh, Illinois. Uh, he, he just had an unbelievable workout. Uh, he, he, he measured in really well. He measured in about seven feet. And he was the biggest, I, I would say he's the biggest riser of the, of the NBA draft combine so far. He's now projected anywhere to middle of the lottery, starting at pick nine as early as the Pistons, and now basically as low as pick maybe 17 or 18. And when you say someone measured in well, obviously, so you're saying like, like the height versus the weight versus the length versus the reach versus the jumping ability. We're talking about just the raw dynamics of the player. Oh, oh, right? Yeah, a lot of it has to do with wingspan, too. Right, uh, you reach. know, when a player has a small wingspan, that's usually a turnoff. Um, but, like, if you take a guy like Thomas Robinson, who measured in without shoes on at just under 6'8", um, or just around 6'8", I'm sorry, uh, you know, for a power forward that is – completely undersized. You know, a power forward in the NBA should be about 6'9", 6'10". Uh, he measured in undersized, but he has a huge wingspan, which, you know, which definitely eases up some of the concerns because it means, you know, he's got longer arms. He can go stretch for rebounds, you know, for dunking purposes, for blocking shots. And that's why it eases some of the concern with the height. You know, you take a guy who's 6'8", any day with a 7, let's just say he has a 7'3 wingspan. I forgot what exactly his wingspan is. But, or let's say a seven-two wingspan over a guy who's six nine and a half with only a you know a six ten wingspan. You know, you take the guy with the longer arms. Is he going to be more physical? He's going to be able to block more shots. And you also have to take a look at vertical leaping at that point too. You know, to see to see how well someone can do on the boards. You know, because, because like I said, an inch in that area can make a big time difference. We're talking with for, NBA scouts. For a power forward. We're talking with NBA scout Zach Barris, lifelong Cleveland sports fan, talking about the NBA. want to mention uh, Brandon, one of our regular contributors for our sports program, just texted in. He may be joining the program. If you are out there listening or if you're finding this on YouTube, if you're on YouTube finding it after the fact, please click that little subscribe button because we do regular radio shows and you can scroll around until something looks interesting, click it and play. And if you're listening live, send us a direct message on Twitter at American underscore media underscore. So you're talking about these players weighing in with with just the raw tools, the raw talent, you know, and, and it's the same thing they do in, in the NFL combine where, where they have their drills they have to do, the 40-yard dash, the, the standing long jump, you know, all of these things. But aside from the, the just the physical specimen component of this, how does another player stand out? Just they get hot on a shooting drill, or is it just the intangibles of how they carry themselves? I, I think a lot of it has to do with how they carry themselves in the interview process. Process specifically, specifically. I'm sorry. No, it's it, <laughs> Zach. A Zach, day. Zach. Let me tell you, I've had two miscues already in the first three minutes. You can hear it when we post it online. I've, um, I've been bumbling over words. But what I was trying to say is, like, you get a guy like Harrison Barnes who walked into the draft combine dressed up, you know, basically in a you know button down the sweater and a pair of slacks when he walked in there, you know, dressed up like he was ready to go to a professional job interview. You know, when a lot of guys show up in workout clothes. You know, it just it just says something about the person that you know he's ready, he's mature enough, you know, and he want, he wants to put the best possible image together as he can to to display his image to these NBA teams. And I think Harrison Barnes does not slide past the Cavaliers at four, unless Kid Gilchrist or Beal is sitting, you know, is sitting on the board there. But I, I cannot see Harrison Barnes falling past the Cavs at four if Kid Gilchrist goes two and Barnes and, and um and Bradley Beal goes three. But Harrison Barnes definitely impressed during the weekend. He measured in at six eight. You know, he also shares an agent with Kyrie Irving, which I think is a big deal, especially in the business today. Uh, and he and Irving are actually close friends. You know, they both, you know, they are rivals. But like Harrison Barnes said all weekend, Kyrie Irving never really had a chance to have a career or two. He played in 10 games. Right. Yeah, that's that's not a, um, enough to develop any rivalry or really camaraderie. But you're saying they're pretty close off the court and they share the same management team. 
Yeah, I mean, which is especially big nowadays because when an agent, let's say, you know, has has a couple players on the same team and one of them, you know, is is a free an, an, an impending free agent, you know, you have to look at that and you go, you know, do I want to separate my guys now or do I want to keep them together and try to put together a winner here? You know, we've got everything working in one city with one particular owner. All of our guys are happy. I think that makes a big difference nowadays. Uh, I think I think especially it, it takes you back in the LeBron James situation. You know, with you know his LRMR, you know, they have they have a fair amount of players, uh, you know, who who they you know who they have in their agency now. You know, they have Tristan Thompson on the Cavs. Luckily, he's represented by you know Rich Paul, who actually has a decent relationship with Dan Gilbert. Uh, but it just brings you back to that point. You know, when when Simmons run under the same management team, they know how the owner's going to act. They know how the owner's going to behave. You know, and you can also talk up the city. So let's let's say he has Harrison Barnes and Kyrie Irving. Let's say he has another prominent player in a couple of years who becomes a free agent, you know, and goes, listen, I've got two clients on the Cavs right now. They both love what they're doing over there. You know, I think you should give Cleveland some consideration in the signing with them. You know, not just because I represent them both, but just because both players I represent there are very happy in their current situation. So, I, I mean, I think that's a big deal, especially when you're drafting this high in the draft. Uh, you, you don't want to create a lot of competition with your players who you have in there. You want them to be friends on and off the court. You know, I, I think the best fit for the Cavs in this draft is personally Michael Kidd Gilchrist, the small forward from Kentucky. He and Irving are, uh, it's known that they're best friends. Uh, Kid Gilchrist even stated over the weekend that his best friend is Kyrie Irving. They played high school basketball together and they've been wow. close for a long, long time. They, they played at St. Patrick's together for a couple of years. That makes a difference when you play and, in high school. You develop a bond that it's, it's like being in battle, you know, whether it's high school or college or whatnot. You develop that bond and they become your brother. Exactly. I mean, that's a big part of it. And you also have the chemistry that, you know, they would have already formed back, you know, six, seven years ago when they started playing together. Right. Rather than being, you know, you know, rather than getting having to get used to each other on the court. Like you know, Larry after, Hughes? Never playing with each other. Remember when the Cavs got Larry Hughes and that worked out so well? Oh, uh, yeah. I mean, yeah, we went to a championship with him. <laughs> no chemistry at all. <laughs> it was not pleasant to watch. It just never gelled. He was one of the best available <laughs> free agents. Why did that thing fail so so poorly? I just think he, the problem is the Cavaliers overpaid for Larry Hughes. He wasn't as good yeah, as advertised. True. He had a fantastic season in Washington that year. He had a career year. His numbers, you know, were so much better than they were in any previous years. And I think the Cavaliers overvalued him and they overpaid for him, obviously, in free agency. And that was, you know, and I mean, he just also, you know, the Cavaliers had him playing, you know, out of position. He was a slasher. And I, I just think he was not a good fit for the Cavs. Uh, I think the best fit for the Cavs would have been Joe Johnson in free agency at the time. But, you know, Joe Johnson went to Atlanta. He wanted to be the number one guy, even though he clearly isn't a number one guy. You know, he wanted to be that guy in Atlanta, and, they, you know, he went there. I think Joe Johnson, if you would have put him on the Cavs, I, I think maybe he would have had a couple championships. But, you know, you can you know, you know never know. But Larry Hughes just wasn't a great fit. And the guy they almost signed instead of him could have even been even worse, and that was in Michael Rett because he was always injured. Right. But a better player than Larry Hughes. We're talking live with NBA scout Zach Barris. Zach, we got a few things to get to, and we know that you are boarding a plane shortly, so we're going to try to move fast. Uh, you know, I had this thought, and I, I, I introduced it in our lead-in, about the LeBron James leaving Cleveland versus Kevin Garnett leaving Minnesota. And it reminded me, and, and I'll let you give some analysis, some insight on that, but in a way it reminded me of U.S. small business or big business for that matter, any business saying, well, I'm going to work hard and, and sort out the problems here in America and make this work, or I'm just going to outsource our, our labor to China, one of these other developing countries, um, and fire everybody at home. Or someone in a marriage that says, well, I don't want to work on this anymore. I'm just going to get a divorce versus, hey, you know, we married each other to sickness and health and uh, richness and poorness. Let's make this work. Um, let's get to that for a second. How would you say LeBron James' situation in Cleveland regarding ownership was similar and different to that of Kevin Garnett in Minnesota? All right, we'll talk about LeBron James first. LeBron James, uh, I think it was the Cavaliers when they drafted LeBron, so they got number one overall. Uh, I think they expect. I don't think they expected to have you know such a significant improvement in his first year, which after they did, you know, they landed in the lottery one time. They were able to pick Luke Jackson, I believe it was, with the 12th overall pick, which yeah. was a terrible. I mean, at the yeah. time it wasn't. You know, he was a shooter. That's what they needed. But looking back on it now, is the Cavaliers never really had any high draft picks. You know, we kept trading them away to try to add talent to piece together with LeBron. You know, LeBron wanted to win right away. Although looking back at that, it was. A, huge mistake for the Cavaliers to try to do that. 
They should have just let their old contracts expire, wait three to four years, you know, and then field a competitive team that could win multiple championships. Looking back on it, kind of like what Oklahoma City just did. Um, but the, let me let me, let me jump though, in there for a second because there were people saying, had we not improved enough, LeBron would have left at the end of that first three years or the first contract or whatever. The that, that's that the thing is that you just didn't really have a choice. LeBron wanted to. LeBron wanted to win right away, and the Cavaliers. The Cavaliers did too. I mean, don't forget we had had. I, I believe it was you know they had had five bad seasons in a row. I, I believe since the '98 playoffs, since they lost to Indiana in the opening round. Uh, you know they hadn't been back, and that was the problem. You know you have five years without playoff basketball, and that means you have to be really bad not to make the playoffs one in five years in the NBA, especially in the Eastern Conference where you can have an under 500 record and make the playoffs every year. Um, I think that played a huge role in it, and the Cavaliers just wanted to win right away. They wanted to field a competitive team, and don't forget they won the championship by year four. You know right. yeah, they, they, they were there a little. They were there very quickly. But, I mean, that, that team in 2007 was really bad. I mean, Sasha Pavlovich was a starter. Larry Hughes was a starter. Drew Gooden was a starter. I mean, they had two two great – they had one great player, a superstar in LeBron James, and they had another really good player in Zydrunas Olgowskis. Everyone else on that team was pretty bad. I mean, it, it makes you wonder how they were able to get that far in 2007. I mean, after a really, really bad year. I mean, just in the Eastern Conference. You know, they beat Detroit, who had a good year. We lost, you know, had been swept the year before by the Spurs. Uh, but Well, the two, it, thi- it just, the two things you know, I'm thinking about that, Zach, that are, you know, when I watched the game yesterday when LeBron just – he barely missed a, a handful of shots. The guy was making every circuit. He reminded me of some of the best games in Cleveland. It was that LeBron that came well, out. Well, but LeBron that, James even stated when yeah. he went to Miami, though, that he didn't want to have to do that anymore. That was not what he wanted in Miami. He wanted it to be easier yeah. so he wouldn't have to put up games like that. I mean, Miami was fighting for their lives last night. You know, Dwayne Wade wasn't doing much. You know, he hasn't done much the entire playoff. You know, he strung together a couple good games. He strung together three good games at the Indiana Series and the first two against Boston. He's been terrible otherwise, though, in, in the Boston Series. And I, I think LeBron's, you know – playing harder than he ever did with the Cavs. I, I think he has to right now. I mean, they're, they're fighting for their playoff lives. You know, Bosch isn't healthy, uh, and, and the team around him is just terrible. I mean, the Cavaliers, though, in LeBron's last year, you know, they were able to piece together, you know, LeBron wanted the, Sha- the Shaquille O'Neal trade. They brought in Shaquille O'Neal. He wanted either Amari Stoudemire was his first choice. They couldn't get him because the Suns bought the deal, despite what anybody may think. The Cavaliers were willing to give up J.J. Hickson. The Suns were the ones who bought that deal. And so they wound up turning around, trading Ogalskis, and they got Antoine Jameson, which LeBron James approved of at the time. You know, LeBron James had a say in just about every free agent or free agent move or trade the Cavaliers made in the organization. You know, they ran everything by him to make sure he approved of it. He did. I, I think that was a mistake, number one, but I think they were doing it to, to attempt to please LeBron and try to get him to resign. Yeah, to get that you know, second contract. You, you, had, you had to screw it up to get that second contract. And let's let's not forget, you know, it, it, if you can look at a team that, that you've had back-to-back MVPs and back-to-back best records in the entire NBA, meaning no team anywhere in the league was doing better than the Cleveland Cavaliers. So all, any of these revisionists that are trying to say, well, it was LeBron and nobody else on the team, that's factually incorrect. Take a look at the roster with Anton Jamison and Zydrunas Ligauskas and Shaquille O'Neal and all the people that we brought in to get the best record. More than one person is required for that. But LeBron James went to a Miami team that was completely gutted for two years, completely tanked to try to build it the right way, except this way they put three superstars in a basket full of nothing around it and the eggs are starting to roll on each other and get cracked a little bit now. You know, it, it just kind of... It, it, it's a It's a contrast in what LeBron valued, he said, well, you know, I'm not going to stay in Cleveland if you tank the team to build it the right way, but I'm going to leave and join a team that tanked so that I could be a part of it. And it just, it's it's really shameful to me. I just don't like how the whole situation played out. I don't either. You know, I'm not a fan of it either, but, you know, what happened happened, and I think he looks at it now is that, you know, that he made a mistake. I, I really do believe that he he's sitting down there, and I don't think he's too happy in Miami. I really don't especially from what I've heard. He does not seem to be very happy down there. And I think, you know, I think he's just getting, I, I, I mean, I don't, I don't feel bad for him at all. I think he just realized that, you know, he's like, I'm on a team with, you know, when Dwayne Wade doesn't play well, you know, they really don't have anyone else. Mario Chalmers is a downgrade from anything the Cavs had. You know, even on the bench, you know, Delonte West was a better player off the bench than Mario Chalmers. Uh, just looking at the whole roster, they don't have a center on that roster. You know, Udonis Haslam is 6'9". Joel Anthony can't move. 
Ronnie Turioff is old, and Dexter Pittman is just, you know, he's awful. So that's the problem. They, they lack a true point guard, and they lack, a, they lack a center. Yes, they have a great power forward, small sport, and a shooting guard that when he shows up is the best shooting guard in the league, and when he doesn't, he's terrible. We, and that's, that's Dwayne Wade. You know, he's been he's been very mediocre this playoffs. He hasn't really contributed much. Talking with and, Zach Barris, NBA scout. Sorry, we got a bit of a delay here. I don't mean to talk over you. Um, Zach, Zach, I, I wanted to get to this real quick because, you know, you mentioned the 07 series where the Cavs went to the NBA Finals a little premature. It kind of got blown out. But you remember that, that LeBron James that had that will to win against the Pistons, the guy that just kept scoring point after point? That's the same LeBron I saw yesterday with the Heat. And, and I'm just, you know, you touched on this a second ago, but I wanted to kind of bring it back around here because Michael Jordan had to put in 50 and 60 points, and he had Scottie Pippen and a, and a bunch of role players. You know, so, I mean, do you think LeBron really thought that the Cavs weren't doing anything for him and it was him against the world and he was he was the best player on the planet and it's the Cavs think, organization's fault and he, he realizes he would, he's wrong? I think he thought he would eventually win a championship in Cleveland, but I don't think one championship was his goal. When he looked at the long-term situation, he goes, you know what? He goes, I can go with Dwayne Wade. You know, they're already a 40, Miami is a 45 win team last year. You had Chris Bosch in the mix. There's suddenly a 52, 53, maybe even a 54 win team. You had me to the mix. We're going to be the best team ever, you know? And I think that's how he looked at it. He said, it doesn't matter who's playing point guard. I'll run the point, you know? <laughs> you know, we're going to dominate everyone. You know, we're, we, we can run the fast break better than anyone. We're quick. You know, we, you know, we were playing with three of the 12 best basketball players in the NBA, even two of the best three, two of the three best NBA players. You know, you know, we're going to go out there and we're going to dominate. I don't think he took Wade's injury history in a, you know, as a factor. You know, in Chris Bosh's inability to play against, you know, a power forward that's tougher than he is. You know, I, I think he overlooked that too. Don't forget, whenever the Cavaliers played the Raptors, Anderson Verjao always dominated Chris Bosh. That's well, just how it was. Verjao was always was underrated. You know, if if, you know, if people around the league hear Verjao, sometimes all they think is flopper or sideshow Bob. But that guy was energy. De- I mean, he still is energy defense. Uh, just just that tenacity, that will to win that Jordan had, that that LeBron had last night, that LeBron had against the Pistons back to take us to the finals with the Cavs. You know, that's what Verjao brings, and and you don't see that intensity on anybody on the other side of the ball for the Miami Heat. That's not named LeBron James. You know, you just don't feel it. Yeah, and I think that I think that's the problem is with, with the Miami Heat. It's just I mean, it seemed like LeBron had to do everything. You know, he's facilitating the offense. Everything ran through him last night. You, you know, any pass that any you know he helped create everybody else's shots. You know, I mean, everything went through him. I have, like I said, I haven't seen that since 2007 in Game Five. Since LeBron play like that, you know, it was an unbelievable performance. I knew after the first quarter, I said, if LeBron keeps playing like this, Boston doesn't stand a chance. And every opportunity Boston had to get back in that game, they blew it big time. Right. You know, they, they couldn't make open threes. They were missing rebounds. They were missing open layups. You know, they were, they were making costly turnovers. Then it seemed like it was, it was just a careless effort on Boston's part. Now, I'm not saying Boston doesn't have a chance in game seven. You know, you, you never know what's going to happen down there. Miami did choke in game five. So there's always a possibility of Boston winning. But, I mean, more likely, I think Miami will win, win game seven. I think it will be a good game, though. I'm not saying it's it's guaranteed, but okay, getting so back to the LeBron Kevin Garnett situation, Kevin Garnett was placed in a scenario in Minnesota earlier in his career where he was surrounded with Stephon Marbury, you know, Wally Zerbiak was there. You know, he had talent around him and when he signed his when he signed his long term deal with them, you know, suddenly Marbury was gone, you know, they were making trades, Zerbiak was gone. They were trading away all the talent and there was Kevin Garnett with a ton of scrub. Minnesota was a mediocre playoff team at that point. And I you know, an ownership basically they went against Kevin Garnett rather than, you know, trying to re-sign him and rather than spending money to bring together a championship team, they went and got rid of him. I mean, got rid of all the talent around him and surrounded him with just a bunch of nobodies, but they knew they were still going to sell seats because Kevin Garnett was the hot ticket in town. He got really upset with ownership, and eventually they traded him for a bunch of young pieces. Okay. You know, in draft picks, granted... Only the one, the only one that ever turned out to be anything was basically Al Jefferson. All right, so le- that that's the Garnett situation in Minnesota, kind of abandoned by the team, not going anywhere. The ownership isn't making the effort. We talked about LeBron James. Uh, you know, you, you run into Dwight Howard, you can't get past him. So what do you do? You go out and overpay for Shaquille O'Neal to clog up the middle. And prior to that injury, you know, I mean, we still have the best record in the league, and we should have beat that Orlando team. You know, it, it was a situation where Orlando hit. Well, we didn't we didn't play Orlando in the playoffs. And when we had Shaq, we didn't play Orlando in the playoffs. Well, right. It was 
so you have two years. One leads to the next thing. It was it was Orlando turns into Boston, and you still can't get past him. And and it just it just seemed like LeBron gave up. He's like, look, we make moves to get through I Dwight think- Howard. We don't even end up facing Orlando. Now we lose to the Celtics. I'm done. I'm out of here. I'm ripping my jersey off. Forget you guys. I'm going home. I do believe LeBron quit on the Cavs, and that's one thing I Me can too. never forgive him for. Same here. I, I still I still can't forgive him to this day because I just don't believe you should quit on your team. You know, I was I was very upset by the decision. Like I said, I, I don't have any I don't have any animosity towards LeBron these days. I really don't. But like I said, is that he quit on the Cavs in the playoffs, which still will always bug me to this day. I don't I don't care who it is splitting. You know, if it, it had it been had it been Jamario Moon, I'm not saying he did, but had Jamario Moon quit on the Cavs, I would be very upset. I'd be just as upset. And but he didn't. But that was saying that when LeBron quit on the Cavs, and then it's the way he held the Cavs hostage in free agency. Right for an entire summer and couldn't let them know what he was doing. He actually held them, you know, for way longer than that. Because they missed out on signing Trevor Ariza and Ron Artest because of that, too, one or the other, because he couldn't make a long-term commitment to the Cavs, which, you know, prevented us from getting – prevented them from being a deep right. team. Well, let me – And Artest – Go ahead. You know, had two, he had a really good year in Los Angeles the year they won the championship, you know, and, you know, things could have been much different in Cleveland. I'm not saying they – I'm not – I have no clue. We can never – we can we can always speculate what would have happened, but we'll honestly never know. Well, what is the difference then? We're talking live with NBA scout Zach Barris. Zach, we, we talked about the LeBron situation with ownership. Um, for, first off, how is Dan Gilbert viewed around the league? I want you to clarify that too, because we have national people listening, but it, it only seems like the local Cleveland sports fans understand how Dan Gilbert is viewed across the league and, and in the in the business. But my second question then is compare Kevin Durant prior to him signing his extension with Oklahoma City compared to Garnett and James. Okay, well, I'll start here with, uh, with Dan Gilbert. Dan Gilbert uh, and the LeBron James era got a rap basically for being willing to spend any amount of money it was to acquire a new player to appease LeBron. That's what he did. When LeBron left, everybody thought he was just this, you know, he was very bitter. Everybody thought he was very bitter. You know, um, some writers even took, you know, shots at Dan Gilbert for doing what he did and, you know, making the comments he did. Some people just thought it was very childish. Now you're looking as, you know, Dan Gilbert passed that. Yeah, I, I don't blame Dan Gilbert for doing what he did. But everybody in the league views him as a, as a good owner, you know, that's willing to spend money, that's willing to improve his team. Like I said, look at the money he spent to go out and get Kyrie Irving. Right. You know, you know, that well, wasn't well, recap that. that. Right. I know, I like, know. Despite what people may think. Yeah, yeah. Re- I, explain that one more time because I know what you're talking about. But reset how we the, got Kyrie. It's Cavaliers, not because we were bad. The Cavaliers traded Mo Williams and um, – Mo Williams and Jamario Moon for basically what we thought at the time was going to be the eighth pick. Had everything stood, stood its ground was normal, it would have been the eighth pick in the draft. And we would have also acquired an aging Baron Davis who was extremely unhappy in his hometown of Los Angeles. Just imagine him sending in the Cleveland. You know, the Cavaliers took on the contract anyways, didn't care. You know, there was an extra $10 million. Right. It was a lot of money, but he, actually, know, he actually had a good attitude in Cleveland from what, I, what I'm aware of. He did. He, had an ex- he, had, he, was, he was incredibly relieved, I think, just to be out of the Clippers. Yeah, division. probably. You know, the way Donald Sterling runs things over there, I can't even... A bad owner. I can't even begin to talk about that. I could go into detail for hours about that. Okay, so... But, but basically, you know, Baron Davis was happy, and the Cavaliers just happened to win the lottery, you know, and Gilbert, essentially, at the time, people go, wow, this guy really wants to win. He just spent $10 million on what was supposed to be the eighth pick in the draft, and right. it turned into the number one. In a weak draft, by the way. A very, yeah, a very weak draft. You know, like I said, the number two player, Derek Williams, who I think, you know, has a chance to be an excellent player in the league, but he's not a superstar slash game changer that's going to be the number one piece on a championship team. That, that's what you're talking about. When you look at the top of a draft, you know, Kyrie Irving last year, I don't think anybody thought, or at least a lot of the writers didn't think Kyrie Irving was going to be a complete game changer and that, you know, that he had such superstar potential and already he is, in the rookie season after playing 11 games in college. Right. You know, but he does. He, he is a, he's going to be a true superstar, I, I think, in this league if he can stay healthy. Okay, let me let me jump and, in there. Let, let me jump in there because i got to steer this back yeah. around because I, I don't know how much more time we have you. I, I, I have about, I have probably about six more minutes. Kevin Durant. Tell me what where he was at prior to signing his extension with Oklahoma City because we just did a tribute to the Seattle fans who had to watch you know Oklahoma City go to the finals just like the Browns had to watch the Ravens win a Super Bowl. So why did Kevin Durant, how did he react to his situation prior to his re-signing in Oklahoma City? What did that do to attract additional talent to a small market Oklahoma City? And where do you see well, the difference between James and Garnett? Uh, here, well, here's, I'm going to start out with Kevin Durant in Seattle. Uh, what happened was Seattle had 
the year prior to getting Kevin Durant, they were, uh, I mean, two years prior to getting Kevin Durant, they were a playoff team. They went deep in the playoffs with Nate McMillan as their coach. You know, they had a talented roster with Ray Allen on it. Uh, you know, Luke Ridnauer was the starting point guard. They were a very talented team. And the following year, they had injuries and just completely collapsed on the stretch. And they had, a, I mean, just a terrible year. McMillan was fired. Uh, Kevin Durant was one, he wound up being, they wound up trading Ray Allen the fifth overall pick for Boston. And, you know, which turned out to be Jeff Green. And they drafted Kevin Durant and Jeff Green. Uh, the, the following year, they drafted Russell Westbrook, and they, I mean they were terrible. Durant's first year, they were horrible. Second year, it was his first year in Oklahoma City, I believe. I remember they were like two and twenty-five at one point. They were absolutely terrible. And they drafted Westbrook, and then the next year they went out and selected Harden with a third overall pick. I mean they got very lucky drafting as high as they did. And I mean you can only imagine with at Portland. I think we discussed this last week. Had Portland wound up with Kevin Durant, and Oklahoma City wound, would have wound up with Greg Oden. I mean. But that's another discussion. But right. Kevin Durant watched the pieces, you know, together. You know, they had he had he had a really bad year one year in Seattle, one horrible year in Oklahoma City, and I believe they had another bad year the following year. And then after the they won fifty games, you know, and, and I think he looked at it and goes, you know what, I'm playing on a talented roster. You know, we went and just traded Jeff Green over to Boston. We got Kendrick Perkins, you know, so now we have a center. You know, they drafted Sergi Baca you know, a, a young power forward who has the potential of a Sean Kemp type player. I think Kevin Durant looked at the situation there. They, they went through the building blocks, basically did, I mean, basically just built their entire team through the draft and through small strategic trades like getting Sabo Cephalosho, which was actually involved with the Cavs three-team deal that sent Delonte west to the Cavs. Cephalosho went to the Sonics. Uh, Larry Hughes went to the Bulls. Ben Wallace went to the Cavs. It was that three-team deal. And, you know, you, you have just a lot of really, really solid pieces on that team with – Kevin Durant being a superstar, Russell Westbrook being a superstar, and James Harden, if he ever gets enough playing time, will be a superstar too. And Durant looked at it and he goes, if I leave for any team in the league, I'm not going to be playing in the same situation I have in Oklahoma City. The fans love me here. I definitely know that. You know, I looked at LeBron's situation. I don't <laughs> want to be put in a situation like right. that. I think he looked at it. And also, is I don't think the talent level is going to get any – I don't think it can get any better than it already is here. The grass and is I think a greener. He looked at those things. I think he was smart about it. I think he appreciates being in a small market city. Uh, you know, that's how it always was in the 80s. You know, a lot of the superstars, you know, Reggie Miller played his entire career in Indiana. You know, you had Elijah Wan played his entire career in Houston, which in Houston back in the, you know, the early 90s was not a big market. And, you know, it just started to change with this day and age now, you know, with social media and everything. Every superstar wanted to be able to play in the Los Angeles, the New Yorks, or Chicago's of the world. You know, that's just how it was. Right, And I think Durant made a smart decision by staying in Oklahoma City. I think he looked at what Tim Duncan did in, in San Antonio rather than leaving for Orlando back in the um, mid-2000s, you know, which he could have done. He was so close to signing a deal with the Orlando Magic. And he decided to go back to San Antonio to keep winning over there, and he did. You know, I, I think it's always smart for a player to play in one place, it, you know, as long as they're willing to surround him with talent and spend money, kind of like what Sam Presley in Oklahoma City has done. So I really give I really give Kevin Durant a lot of credit because he made he just made a smart move. You know, he, he re upped with the team, you know, he knew it would take a few years to get there, but they built it the right way, you know. That's what I said, you can't cut corners in the NBA to go and try to win too fast. You know, Miami he got very, very, very lucky in order to do what they're doing. They're, you know, Mickey Harrison was in a very fortunate situation. He and Pat Riley had eyed that from the start, but you know, at the same time, Dwayne Wade could have easily left for Chicago. LeBron could have re-signed in Cleveland, and he had Chris Bosh go to Cleveland. And Miami would have been stuck with absolutely nothing. You know, like I said, Miami got very, very lucky with the situation they were in. You know, it doesn't always turn out like that. And we might see that from the Brooklyn Nets this summer. You know, a lot of teams, just because you want a scenario to play out a certain way doesn't mean it will. So you do, do you see, we're talking with Zach Barris, NBA scout, do you see any parallels or similarities between the, the, the two things I brought up, whether it's small businesses or any business that's struggling and says, I'm either going to, I'm got i going to outsource this or I'm just going to close my doors and give up, or a marriage that, that may be in some rocky times where either you get a divorce or you try to make it work. With, with those three players, Durant, LeBron, and, and Garnett, are there any of those analogies that that? I, I think I think Kevin Durant stayed with a small business and realized you know that his company has a lot of potential. It's kind of like it's kind of like basically a Facebook MySpace thing where he was you know MySpace at the time was a bigger company, but you know which he could have technically left for you know, but he stayed with Facebook to try to build it up from the ground. And that's what they did. Now Facebook's worth you know billions of dollars, but MySpace is only worth thirty million nowadays. You know that's how much it sold for a year ago. You can take it looking at like that. 
Uh, LeBron James left for the greener pastures. Basically, he, um, you know, he basically outsourced everything. He left. Uh, Kevin Durant was just in a bad marriage with, you know, with the Minnesota Timberwolves. Garnett. And basically, it's like he got divorced and was a much happier person as soon as his divorce, you know, was finalized. Well, so, some situations and, you needed, you know, if there's abuse, and if you're not being surrounded with the tools that you need to do your job, you know, you can say that's abusive, or there could be physical abuse. You know, it's obviously not the same. We're just trying to draw some of these broad parallels here. But, yeah, I mean, it wasn't a good situation for Garnett, so Garnett takes off in it and whatever. You have Durant. He's in a good situation. He notices it. He realizes it, and he capitalizes on it. LeBron was in a good situation, and he bailed on it. And now he's, you know, either this will work I out. Think, I think he won't. regrets the situation, but looking at it from an overall standpoint, I have about one more minute before my, before my flight begins to board. Uh, I'm going to close it with this, though. Is I think the Cavaliers now are in a better situation than they were with LeBron because it could have been disastrous if LeBron re up for another three years with the Cavaliers and they had not won. Uh, I, I, I think because, you know, they'd have trouble beating Oklahoma City as it is. Right. And especially with an aging roster, and that team was really badly injured the year LeBron left. You know, everybody was injured on that team that year. Uh, I, I think that now you have the pos- you have the ability to build through the draft. You know, you have Kyrie Irving, you have Tristan Thompson. You know, fortunately, they're going to wind up with you know either Kit Gilchrist, Bradley Beal, or Harrison Barnes. They're going to be very lucky to get one of those guys, and we'll get one of them. Zach, let me you ask know, you. I, let me I, ask you real quick. I know you probably have twenty seconds. Who goes one, two, three, four, five in the NBA draft, as far as you can guess, as of right now? I'm going to say Anthony Davis, one to the uh, to the Hornets. I'm going to say Michael T. Gilchrist, two to the Bobcats, but I honestly think they're trying to trade that pick. Uh, I think three is going to be Brad Beal to Washington. Four, you're going to have uh, Harris Barnes of Cleveland, and I think five is the wild card to Sacramento. I think you could see along the lines of Andre Drummond going as high as number five to Sacramento. I think you can see I, – I, I think it's honestly going to be Thomas Robinson at five. I don't think Thomas Robinson slides past the Kings at five, though. We've been talking with Zach Barris, NBA scout. You can find him on Twitter at Z-B-A-R-I-S. Zach, any final words for our listeners? I just want to say thanks for having me on. I really appreciate it. Uh, you know, I didn't think I was actually going to have this much time today. I thought it was going to be more of a condemned segment. But thank you so much again for having me on. I'd love to be on in the future. All right. This sounds like a plan. Appreciate your time. Cleveland sports fan and NBA scout Zach Barris joining us today on the Unhappy Hour. He's getting ready to board his flight to return out here to the left coast after the NBA scouting combine this past few days. Zach is a regular contributor to our show, and please check him out on Twitter. If you're watching on YouTube, go on Twitter and get him at Z-B-A-R-I-S. If you want to get some good NBA basketball information, follow him there. He's one of the best. I mean, he know he... He's really good. He's he's a sharp character that understands the world of the NBA. 